I'd like to start by welcoming you all to the session today and thank you for joining us at the Sankal Global Summit. My name is Azmina Mayat. I am an analyst at the Carbon Trust, where I am responsible for the management of the Powering Renewable Energy Opportunities Program, which is a demand-led productive use of energy program. I'm also a project manager on the African-led project, which is developing a standardized mini-grid tariff tool as part of the Transforming Energy Access Program. Um, as well as working amongst other projects, looking at carbon reporting, sustainable reporting, and setting net zero targets. On behalf of Energy Catalyst and the SunCal team, I am extremely pleased to welcome you to today's session titled Promoting Clean Energy Access for Productive Use. Before I hand over to Trester to give an introduction to Energy Catalyst, I'd like to give us a brief intro into today's session. So while renewable and affordable energy supply is vital for people living in rural communities um, to power their homes and businesses, energy access alone is not enough to transform economies. Rural energy programs need to consider the social and economic context for each local area and build partnerships that give people access to finance, technology, and markets. Productive use of energy typically refers to the type of energy demand that generates revenue, increases productivity, and enhances diversity and creates economic value. Um, this can include investment into innovative solutions such as solar water pumps, e-motorbikes, um, mini-grid solutions, healthcare, and education, all ensuring an increase, an increase in access to renewable energy. Um, just some Basic background in today's proceedings, this will consist of a 60-minute panel discussion between entrepreneurs funded through Innovate UK's Energy Catalyst Program, um, developing productive use of energy solutions for rural communities and experts from the wider sector, exploring the different roles for productive use of technologies and business models in the provision of clean energy access. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Tristan Mansville from the Carbon Trust to introduce us to Energy Catalyst. Great, thanks, Asmina. Um, and hello, everyone. So my name is Tristan Mansfield. I'm a senior analyst at the Carbon Trust, and I'm part of the team delivering the support to innovators through the Energy Catalyst program. Um, so firstly, just to give a bit of background um, to Energy Catalyst, um, as Asmina said, it's an Innovate UK programme um, that aims to accelerate the innovation needed um, for a just and inclusive energy transition um, in order to reach SDG 7. Um, so through providing financial and advisory support, um, as well as creating strategic partnerships, um, and uncovering key insights, um, NG Catalyst helps to bring, bring to market these technologies um, and business models to improve lives across Africa and Asia. Um, so NG Catalyst has four main objectives. So firstly, to accelerate solutions. Um, so there's the financial and advisory support we provide um, gives a springboard for the innovators to de-risk, demonstrate and deploy their solutions for ending energy poverty. Um, the second is to build networks. So really encouraging those strategic partnerships and connections um, across the whole energy access ecosystem um, to help with that commercialization of these um, innovative technologies and business models. The third is to unlock impact. Um, so yeah, really helping those innovators to find new ways to improve lives in Africa and Asia and creating economic, economic opportunities, which I think, um, yeah, that, that part's particularly relevant for the session we have today and, and not just providing that energy, but providing those opportunities for, for the people that need it. Um, and then finally, share, sharing knowledge. Um, so uncover, uncovering key insights um, based on learning, it, it helps Energy Catalyst to contribute to knowledge, case studies, and lessons learned, um, and not just for the companies within the programme, but also benefiting the wider energy access ecosystem. Um, and so how do we achieve this? So NG Catalyst has three key activities to deliver this vision. Um, so the first is collaboration, um, and this is really getting partners from across the world together um, who have the expertise 
needed to develop these innovations um, and get them ready for market. Um, the second is competition. So we have open funding calls for grants um, and providing these grants for innovative solutions. And then finally, acceleration. So all of those awarded funding um, through the programme are also put on an accelerator programme. And, and this is to make sure the organisations are commercially ready as well as techno technologically ready um, for market. So that's a very brief introduction to Energy Catalyst. Um, let me know if you do have any further questions um, about that, either in the chat or after the session, you can get in touch with me. Um, I'm going to pass back to Asmina now so we can start hearing from some of the companies in the Energy Catalyst programme, um, as well as from the wider UK system. Thanks very much, Tressa. Um, I think that was a really interesting introduction into the opportunities and what Energy Catalyst uh, can offer and the wider sphere. Um, this now leads us on to the main agenda item for today, which is our panel discussion on productive use of energy solutions, technologies, and business models. Um, before I introduce us to our panelists, um, as we go through this session, I would like to encourage all the attendees today to be please send along your questions in the chat. We'll try to get to them while we have this discussion. And if not, we will try to get to them after. But we do encourage you to please send across any questions you may have. Um, I'd like to introduce you to our five panelists today. The first is Catherine Bottrell, who is the CEO of Pelio. We then have Nathan Simonis, the head of mini grid business and asset finance from Victoria Technology. Laura Cochran, Chief Business Development Officer of Aptech Africa, Dr. Bernie Jones, the Managing Director of Smart Village Research Group, and Aaron Leopold, the Chief Executive Officer of Enegro. Um, welcome all, um, and thank you for being here. Um, Catherine, maybe we'll start with you, and then we'll move on down the list. If you could please introduce yourself and give a quick overview of your organization, the work you do and maybe some of the projects you'd like to highlight, especially those within Energy Catalyst. Hi, thank you. Um, yes, I'm Catherine Bottrell and I'm founder of Pilio, which is a company that spun out of Oxford University now 11 years ago, um, which I founded with my co-founder, Dr. Russell Labry. And we've been focusing the last 10 years in supporting businesses on their energy transition and um, net zero journey, especially around carbon, and have been working um, developing a range of analytic tools. And this brings us to our kind of opportunity that we've been in with the Energy Catalyst, which is to work with our um, co-collaborators, Himaverti in Pakistan. And what we've been looking at is thinking about the fashion supply chain, which accounts for um, globally around 4% of global emissions. And many of those emissions are in the pr production of natural fibers such as cotton. And Pakistan is the fifth largest producer of cotton and has many of the livelihood challenges um, that the Sankalp Summit is um, considering and how do we provide clean, affordable and sec um, accessible energy. And so we've been really focused on the cotton supply chain and working with communities to bring about um, and unlock the financing for supporting microgrids, the water pumps, and things like the electric scooters. Um, and I'll um, and we've been in the Energy Catalyst to really run a feasibility study of how to develop what we call um, carbon insetting. Many people on this call are probably familiar with carbon offsetting, which is how do you compensate for emissions? Um, and many of the fashion companies are setting their net zero targets, but our um, concept and business model is how do we support these fashion companies to um, compensate for their emissions within the supply chain and provide clean and accessible energy. And so um, as we go into the discussion, I'll give more um, richness to that project, but move to the next um, panelist. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Nathan, over to you. Uh, hi, I'm Nathan Sermonis, uh, one of the co-founders of Victoria Technology. We're based in uh, Cape Town, South Africa. Thanks so much for for hosting us today for this discussion. Um, 
our company is focused on scaling renewable uh, projects across sub-Saharan Africa, in particular, um, under the Energy Catalyst 8 uh, program. We are focused on a scalable um, battery leasing model for mini grids. Um, over the years, we, through our research, we have seen that uh, one of the big challenges um, in in cost models for mini grids has been oversizing of systems and uh, challenges to predicting user demand. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's there's uh, technology and finance reasons for that, among many other things. But we're just focused on the technology and finance, and and so uh, scalability of battery systems um, and uh, and and financing of scalable systems over the uh, fifteen to twenty years that you expect a mini grid to exist is a challenge currently uh, in this space, and um, and so our feasibility study is is focused on um, understanding how we can build a, a sustainable, scalable business model that uh, tackles that challenge. B batteries are 20 to 30% of a capex of a mini grid system, the, the most expensive single component of those systems, and uh, probably technically the most challenging, but they're incredibly important for PUE uh, applications for electric uh, cooking, for refrigeration, freezers, you know, other things that we're going to be talking about on the call today. So we, um, we work hand in hand with the, uh, the providers of those services and mini grids who are doing um, these services themselves. And um, we aim to support the expansion of, um, of mini grid systems over time uh, through our service in, in an affordable, scalable way. Uh, that uh, that maintains controls the cost of tariffs and um, provides appropriate capacity expansion um, alongside user demand and uh, the activities of my colleagues on the the panel today. So thanks so much. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, Laura. Uh, hello, everyone. It's so great to be here today. Uh, my name is Laura Corcoran, and I'm the Chief Business Development Officer at Aptech Africa. I'd like to start by thanking Energy Catalyst Program for inviting Aptech to participate today. Uh, we really appreciate the support we've received from Innovate UK and Carbon Trust, so thanks for that. Um, so Aptech Africa is an engineering procurement and construction company for solar energy and water pumping projects. We have the mission to increase access to clean electricity and water for people across Africa. We've been around for over 10 years. Um, we currently have offices and operate in seven countries across Africa. This includes Uganda, South Sudan, DRC, Central African Republic, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Niger. We have um, over 100 employees across all of our offices, and the majority of these are engineers and technicians. So they provide energy assessment, design, supply, installation, and project maintenance. And we provide a variety of solar applications. These include off-grid, grid-tied, and hybrid systems, mini-grids, energy storage, power transmission and distribution. And then we also do solar water pumping, irrigation, water purification, and distribution solutions. Um, and so what I'm going to talk a little bit about today, uh, the program, the Energy Catalyst program supported us is a project called Pay and Pump. Um, so Pay and Pump is a solar water pump and irrigation solution. It uses smart technology to offer water as a service um, to small scale farmers. Um, it's a solution that's delivered at no cost to the farmer, and then farmers can use mobile money to make payments to activate their pumping system whenever they want to use it. Uh, the pay and pump solution comes with the support of agronomists, and these provide advice to farmers regarding agricultural best practices to increase their crop yields. Um, it also provides full maintenance to ensure the pumping systems are working. And it's a comprehensive solution to help small scale farmers in Uganda get the most productivity from their land. Um, and I think the most exciting part about pay and pump is the impact that we've seen. Um, so case studies show that con with consistent use, crop yields increase between 100 to 250%. Um, they also show a significant reduction of manual labor for fetching water and irrigation. This is especially for women. 
Um, and this results in the increase of free time that can be used for other activities, such as income generations or spending time with family. Um, and due to our marketing technique, we, we conduct um, outreaches and educational sessions with farmers to sensitize them about solar water pumping and irrigation. Um, so because of this, we've been able to increase awareness amongst thousands of smallholder farmers across Uganda. So it's a really exciting project and thank you for letting me share it today. Thanks for our Bernie. Hi, good afternoon and good morning to everybody. And thanks very much to the Energy Catalyst and Sankalp Forum for providing us with the opportunity of speaking today. So I'm from Smart Villages Research Group, uh, which is a UK based company which develops and installs integrated community technology solutions uh, across Africa and elsewhere in the world in the global south. Um, so for us, like for everybody else, productive use is, is key, but not just productive use of energy. I mean, actually, productive use of any community asset, we think, is, is critical uh, in the Global South and, and everywhere else. So for us, sustainable business models uh, for the communities are also super important. We always work in a bottom-up approach, so starting with the community and asking the community what their priorities are, and then we try to design bespoke solutions that actually solve their various priorities not just one technology priority but maybe assembling different technologies so that it's a, an integrated system that works well together to address their main challenges um, we research innovative technologies if there's no off-the-shelf uh, solution readily available and so some of the interesting technologies that we've developed through the energy catalyst program are uh, low-cost low-tech rural cold, cold stores uh, in uganda um, one-stop shops for farmers in remote agriculture, uh, remote agricultural communities, which we call smart agri-centers, which are solar-powered things which de deliver all the services that uh, farmers need in order to make more money from uh, their agricultural activity. And indeed, those also provide wider uh, energy services to the whole community as well. And things like um, uh, innovative uh, combination of water pumping and milling machine technology for remote uh, boreholes as well. So we've had um, uh, Energy Catalyst 6, 7 and 8 projects. Um, and uh, yes, are keen to continue our work and work with more partners. Thank you. And Aaron, last thing you. Great, uh, thank you. Um, and, and thank you very much for the kind invitation uh, to participate here. Um, so a little bit about myself and, and, and Agro. So I've been working on uh, rural electrification in Africa since about 2010. And uh, previously, before I came to run Enero, I was the CEO of the Industry Association of all the mini grid companies in Africa. And uh, my passion has always been uh, big systems change and and scalable, massively scalable solutions. And while I believe that mini grids and and off grid electrification are really uh, the heart and soul of of the electrification movement of the 21st century here in. in Africa. Um, the one thing that's always been missing from all this work is really a focus on the fact that, you know, until supply equals demand, uh, we don't really have a marketplace. We have a scenario where there's a real need for, for donor financing um, until supply does equal demand. And right now, the major gap in financing for um, rural electrification uh, in Africa is the fact that poor people are poor. And uh, this isn't going to change. Uh, unless we work with communities, work with governments, work with um, the companies and, and other players working in these communities uh, to really help people use power to earn an income, uh, which is the whole point of, of this session. Um, and as, as Mina mentioned earlier on, productive use of energy is, is really about helping people earn an income. But what Enero does um, is we simply are a microfinance company. And we are, if you want to think about it in a, in a very, very simple way, uh, you know, we've got the pickup truck of the energy company uh, rolling out uh, to the rural communities with um, cables and, and poles and, and um, inverters. And then the Enero pickup truck is bouncing along behind it filled with refrigerators and electric cooking equipment and carpentry equipment. Um, to then help the community use that energy productively. But we define productive uses of energy as anything that will allow someone uh, or will will, have, will give someone more money in the end of the week uh, in their pocket than they had at the beginning. So this encompasses both money earning technologies and money saving technologies. So for instance, we very much consider clean cooking technologies, electric cooking technologies uh, to be productive as well. 
uh, because they're both productively helping the mini grid or energy company earn more money. They're helping the rural community save money. Um, and there's more money floating around at the end of the week, but also there's a myriad of other benefits. So I don't want to get bogged down in, in definitions at all, but I think it's, it's really important, um, to sort of not put labels on everything and, and allow people to decide for themselves, uh, what the technologies are that are, that are most useful. And I think one of the challenges that we've seen in the productive use space so far is to label, um, you know, solar water pumping or solar refrigeration as productive, uh, whereas, you know, because they're also easy to finance because they, they can be standalone in many cases. Um, they can have a GPS tracker installed in many cases. So investors love to fund them. Our company is a little bit different because- um, uh, Sorry, apology. I'm yes. going to tell you to please wrap this up. We would like to get onto our questions in a moment. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> All good. Yeah, we're not a Catalyst <laughs> member, so I didn't know exactly what to describe here. So I'll, I'll pass it over to you then. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, thanks all for those introductions. Um, let's get into our questions. Um, I think I'd like to start with Catherine and Bernie, if possible. Um, and my question for both of you is to look at what are your plans in terms of scaling up the business and the project? Um, which are other areas you're looking into and where would you like to see your initiative uh, going? Um, Catherine, maybe we'll start with you if you could give us a short answer and then Bernie will come across to you. Yeah, so um, this year we've been um, developing our solution um, and we've deployed it in five villages. And as many of the other speakers have described it's about being with technology agnostic so it is um thinking so the first thing is that we want our communities to have kind of agency over the the suite of technologies that will serve their needs so the first part of it has been really truly understanding what are their energy demands and what kind of technologies they want to um develop and have access to. And then the second of that has been developing the kind of enterprises within the village communities that will help them, um, as also the other panelists have said, you know, generate income, but also have that provision of energy. So that's been a, a really critical piece of us, you know, at the, at the grassroots level to ensure that we're designing the right solution. And then the second bit has been to ensure with the fashion companies that we're working that um, we can really support them in understanding their kind of um, greenhouse gas impact into that um, into the cotton growing producing communities. And so that's really looking at um, the scope three emissions and how to calculate that. So our big piece is how do we develop kind of uh, the software tools, which has been core part of Pilio, but to, to, to do that through the supply chain. And then the third bit, which is, again, what the panelists have talked about, is um, the business model. So ours is developing a blended finance model. So understanding what is the um, the willingness to pay and contribute from the fashion brands to um, compensate for the greenhouse gas emissions in their supply chain. And on the ground, um, and the, the solution designed is that the, the fashion companies are contributing to the, the kind of capex. And then the communities is the um, operational running costs of those um, solutions. So um, the last bit is our, our vision is to kind of deploy that at scale um, to ensure that we have a scalable model that reach. So at the moment, we're working to engage with fashion companies that would go into the full phase scale pilot of our solution. Thanks. Uh, Bernie. So um, in terms of our, our general working communities, obviously, we'd like to scale that up at the moment. We're working in uh, we've been working in 18 different communities, so we'd like to continue that work. But in terms of the um, uh, the specific innovative technologies that we've uh, developed and where we start to see some real uh, community impacts, I'm thinking now particularly of the, the cold stores and these smart smart agri centers uh, for remote rural farming communities. Um, we're getting some remarkable impact data back from them. You know, the smart agri centers so far, we're only halfway through the, uh, uh, the testing of those, but it's looking as though they can increase farmer yields by between three and five fold, um, just by having all of those services technologies available. So if, 
if technologies like that can make that degree of impact, we would ideally like to scale those into sort of one or 200 more communities over the next, uh, over the next five years, because uh, there is certainly a need for solutions like that. And uh, we try to design our solutions in a, in a flexible manner so that they can not only uh, uh, do the specific task they, um, they're designed for, but they can integrate more widely into other systems. So the smart agri-centers, for example, could be the center of a mini-grid uh, if people are implementing mini-grids as well. So we're, it's the combination of things, seeing where there's the greatest amount of impact for communities and the, the things that, that have a sustainable business model behind them so the community can, can continue to run them and scale them themselves. Uh, but then seeing where the systems are flexible enough uh, that they can be integrated into all sorts of different uh, solutions for those communities as well. So when we find a, a technology like that, um, then that's something that we uh, we want to, to scale quite heavily. Thanks. Um, I think you actually brought up a great point about looking at the impact um, that the solutions are having. Um, and maybe this is a question I can give to you, Aaron, Nathan and Laura. Just how are you measuring the impact of your solutions and determining the success of your solutions amongst your customers um, and sort of uh, the satisfaction with the products and the services? So what is your process of doing that? Um, maybe, Nathan, we'll start with you. Uh, sure. Thanks, Osmina. Um, so for us... Measuring impact, I think, is uh, going to be important, obviously, for our investors and for you know our uh, our, our our feeling of you know this is this is a, a successful business model. Um, but we've so we've we've designed um, certain measurement protocols for our mini grid clients because at the end of the day, our connection to the community and the PUE activities is the the mini grid developer, the operator. Um, and I think there are a number of companies out there that we've spoken to who are doing really great impact studies um, at a very deep level, um, comparative, you know, before and after electrification, but it's very intensive. And, um, you know, income measurement before and after an activity is, is the like pretty immediate number one uh, uh, measurement of, of success, I think. Um, and, and beyond that are a lot of other, uh, social impact metrics that, uh, are under consideration, but, uh, it's definitely difficult for mini grids operators who, who, you know, don't have a massive team to actually go out there, um, and, uh, and do this, this kind of research. So another thing that we're exploring is, um, how do we assess the, the demand, you know, the energy use? Um, trends and uh, across customers and knowing like what appliances are in a, in a community, um, how do we then uh, project like uh, based on the before and afters, what does that mean? Um, or, you know, I guess make, uh, make judgments on what impact we're having based on that, that data from afar, because it's, it's quite difficult to get on the ground and do those interviews um so that's something that we're continuing to explore but i think is really important for um us as a company to figure out once we start launching our uh, our, our leasing service hopefully next year is when we'll actually start doing it so in development phase now but um uh definitely an important thing for for consideration um, and Laura, how are you going about doing your monitoring um, and measuring of impact and the success you're having with your customers? Um, yeah, so when it comes to impact, we're looking at both qualitative and quantitative um, data. So from a business model standpoint, we're looking at things like what's the default rate, what's the revenue generated, how many systems have we installed. Um, but we also conduct case studies 
studies, um, and these look at additional metrics. We do baseline surveys and then surveys after the first harvest season to look at yields, um, so increased yield or increased income from each harvest. Um, we also look at jobs created either directly through the system operation or indirectly. Um, we look at if families are harvesting more nutrient dense crops. Uh, we look at qual qualitative things like increase of free time um, for families since they're not doing manual labor, um, addition of other income generating activities. Um, and we, we really try to look at the, the impact specifically for women and then people um, with mobility, mobility challenges to see how the system's kind of impacting them in their daily lives. Great. Um, and Aaron, maybe just a question for you around sort of um, the work you're doing um, and the impact you're having. I think you raised a few good points as you were discussing the work that you're doing. Um, but I also want to touch a bit more on sort of um, that impact and success, but also where are you monitoring the success? Whereas you feel that your customers are feeding back that sort of positive reinforcement and giving that encouragement encouragement um, in terms of scaling up the business and where are you looking to also take that in terms of your scale up opportunities? Sure. So um, in terms of the impact metrics, I mean, our impact metrics are sort of core to, to our business because if we are not helping the energy company increase revenues, then we're not really delivering on the business model that we're, we're trying to build. So uh, we tap directly into the metering information from national utility, the national utility here in Uganda. So we're partnered here with the, the national energy distributor, uh, as well as a number of mini grid companies. And, um, you know, the model is basically to get a data, you know, sharing permission from our customers when we sign them up for a micro loan. And during the course of that loan, we're monitoring both their, their energy consumption, but also we're monitoring their, obviously their repayment of the loan, but then also we're asking them monthly about their income changes as part of our, our collections work. So we're very consistently monitoring both energy consumption, income, and ability to pay. Um, and so we have quite robust metrics just from our sort of standard uh, operations and very, very, uh, you know, heartwarmingly and, and uh, you know, thankfully, you know, the average customer that we see as a 400% increase in lifetime customer value um, based on just the first six months of energy consumption after they become an Enerbro customer. And they're increasing their incomes by um, around 50%. The, the early numbers were much higher than 50%. Now they're in the 40s. So we're, we're still in our pilot phase. So, so the, those numbers are still being evened out. Um, but in terms of scalability, you know, we are now, as I mentioned, partnered with the National Utility. And they see such value in, in collaborating with us that we're entering into a national communications and, and marketing collaboration with them. Um, and also um, nine national utilities and governments in, in other African markets um, have also indicated interest in, in having us figure out how, how to work with um, their energy systems in, in those other markets. So uh, we are the only company that I am aware of that's kind of doing what we are doing. So we see a huge market gap, uh, which means there's a huge scalability uh, potential there. And the, the impact metrics so far are very promising. So, so um, I think, yeah, there, there's your answer. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'd like to just remind everyone that if you have any questions, please pop them into a chat. Um, we are happy to bring them into the session. Um, Laura and Catherine, I think there's been a lot of speak around successful business models or sustainable uh, business models. In terms of working with um, the villages that you're working in um, and the customers that you have, how are you monitoring the success of these business models in terms of understanding where things are going well, how things need to be changed. Um, are you offering separate business models to your customers or it has to become sort of a negotiation with each village or each customer in terms of what that looks like? Um, Laura, maybe we'll start with you and then Catherine will come across to you. Sure, yeah, so um, we understand how happy our customers are through customer surveys. Uh, we do these on a quarterly basis. 
And with our business model, there's a big emphasis on creating a relationship with our customers. Um, and that's kind of part of the success of, of the business model is that we create that relationship between the client. And then we have agronomists who are in the field. They're interacting with the clients. They know what they're farming. They know where they live. They are telling them when to irrigate, how much to irrigate based on their soil. Um, and, and they're constantly checking in to see what challenges they might have with the system or with irrigation in general, because sometimes irrigation is new to these farmers. So we really try to provide a holistic support for these farmers um, so that they're able to irrigate with as much confidence as they can. And therefore, they're getting the crop increases. And then we're going to see the product uptake that um, is going to be successful for this business model. And as far as financing, uh, we've received grant support that's helped us roll out these um, our first pilot systems. Um, and we're self-financing for now. And as we continue to... Um, install more systems, we're going to look for outside financing. But right now, it's a self-finance project. Catherine. Yeah. Um, yeah, so for our um, work in um, Pakistan, so we firstly, we partnered with WWF Pakistan that um, uh, it's a delivery partner for the Better Cotton um, certification. So we're working with a kind of wide network um uh, Better Cotton has been working in Pakistan for over 10 years and works with thousands of villages and has those relationships. And our solution is almost like a, a sustainable cotton plus. Um, so that's one element. And then the second bit is um, bringing on board um, microfinance partners. So in this first phase, um, we've been we've got two different microfinance partners. Um, one is uh, a farmer development organization that um, lends to farmers. And the second is one that um, called Kashef, who um, lends to um, women. So, so it's um, been really valuable learning um, to understand how both of those microfinance partners um, operate. And I would say the second thing is that we've kind of learned through that experience is one, this is really new um, as um, I think Aaron was talking about like micro grids um, and the business models behind them are really innovative. And um, there's not a commercial model for micro grids in Pakistan. They've always been um, dominated by the ones that exist have been 100% um, public grant funded. And so we're introducing something new. So it's been, I think, in this first phase, a really um, co-learning uh, journey with the microfinance partners, how to structure it. And we had initially kind of had a, uh, because we're just in the feasibility stage, um, one, one approach, you know, um, in terms of the, the blended finance between what the, the villages paid and what um, the, the kind of uh, private sector or public finance into this model is. And as we move forward, we're looking at a more tiered um, approach because also the different the villages have different um, abilities to pay and different energy needs so we've um, we're now doing a more kind of um, flexible configurable model so also under our microfinance it's um, being able to be a bit more modular in how the microgrid is organized so one there's two models at the moment for our microgrids one is a um, a central kind of service around uh, an energy, uh, what we call it, energy DABA. And so then it's an energy service and then the households pay. And then the second model is the, the microgrids is modular on the individual households. So I think what we've learned is one, how to structure the um, microfinance package and also how to design our technologies so that we can be a bit more flexible about um, the payment plans. Um, and the last thing I'll say has been really important, which I think kind of connects with what Bernie's been talking about, is the um, governance model and um, being ensure that we're working with the villages and that they are, are self-organizing to administer and manage the, um, the kind of contractual relationship. So that has been another big part of our project and learning under the feasibility study under the energy catalyst. Thanks. Um, actually, that's a question I want to ask for Bernie. In terms of that government engagement that you're involved in with the different villages, um, how has that been working? Um, are they based on setting up sessions? Um, 
how are you directing that engagement with your other stakeholders and your communities and these businesses to sort of scale up? Um, and what do you expect to see um, this taking your solution going forward? Every every community is obviously a little bit different, so I don't mm -hmm. think there's a there's a single solution that that fits it all. So the way that we try and do it is is through a, a number of of different ways. One is that we always work with local partners, and those are typically partner organisations who are present quite often in those communities. So even if nothing else were to happen, they would most likely you know go and visit those communities on an ongoing basis and could report back. Um, but we always try to set up a village governance structure for whatever project we do, whether that's a, a village energy committee or it's a village agricultural committee or it's the village agricultural cooperative, or if it's a, uh, if it's a private solution uh, that's, that's done for, say, a borehole operator, uh, we get them to put together a little committee with a few other people from the community so they can, they can consult a little bit. Um, and we help them set those... Um, uh, those up where they are uh, where there's say in a village energy committee that's that's running a, uh, a piece of technology technology solution we draw up an mou between themselves and ourselves and the local partners uh, so that they know that we will continue to support them in the long term not just for the narrow time window of uh, whatever project has has implemented that technology there uh, but then they also know that their responsibility is to let us know what's going on, give us the minutes of the meeting, so we can we can tell what people in the community are are saying, how they're reacting uh, to to the systems, and how they're able to use them. Um, and then, of course, you can also um, uh, supplement that that kind of governance structure and the information that you get from that with uh, more detailed surveys. But as Nathan was saying, you know that costs money, and one thing that's that the energy catalyst projects have been very good for is we've been able to bolt on a lot of quite detailed impact surveys onto that. But obviously, uh, if you're a mini grid developer, um, you can't necessarily do that degree of research on every single project that you do because that's that's quite hard. Which is which is a shame actually because uh, the uh, the impact of any solution isn't just how many kilowatt hours you're supplying and how much people are paying. It's actually in five years' time is it making a difference to their healthcare outcomes or their the education of their kids, and that's the sort of thing that you need much more presence in a community or much more detailed survey to find out. So we always try and set up a local governance structure and support the community in doing that. Um, so that we know that they are engaged with it as well, and they feel like it's it's a it's a technology solution that belongs to them and the community, and that they you know whether or not they're actually in charge of managing it, they still feel that they have a degree of influence over it. Um, and Nathan and Aaron, um, just one more question from me is: Where do you see the PUE sector um, heading in sort of five years, ten years time? Um, and how do you think we can achieve what we want to achieve in that timeline for productive use of energy? Um, Nathan, we'll start with you and then Aaron will come across to you. Yeah, I think, um, I, I mean, it seems to me there's a, there's a bit of a, um, a mix between the, the kind of support uh, or enablers like Energrow and Aaron's company and, and some mini grid companies who do PUE efforts themselves, and um, it's been like this for a while. I, I think it, uh, uh, there will be more Energrows, or Energrow is going to, you know, just spread all over the continent. Who knows? Um, but I think that's really important too, because it, you know, the DNA of mini grid companies, um, and I only speak of, of mini grids because that's what we really deal with. Um, so the standalone PUE stuff is is a bit out of my um, my purview, but um, mini grid companies dna is a little bit different and they they have different approaches but i think those will continue forward but for us what we really think is essential is maintaining the low tariff um or or improving the the cost of tariffs because as many mills and epcs and etc you introduce to a community you have to have affordable energy to make it work and what that's why we you know we focus on uh, these scalable solutions because if you build a system with a massive battery bank that's designed for what you think is year five um it's going to be already overbuilt overfinanced and it's really going to hurt the the business model for the mini grid itself and potential pue 
um, additions uh, into that that uh, mini grid ecosystem. So we believe that with scalable systems that a lot for small energy users, lights, cell phones, uh, things like that for the first year or two, and then introduction of PUE appliances as familiarity uh, improves, then we, you know, then we add in uh, our scalable battery leasing um, and pr provide um, the, the correct capacity for the kind of efforts um, that I think are necessary for community development and uh, income generation through these, these PUE technologies. So um, yeah, I think scalable systems and uh, continued very uh, proactive um, PUE efforts like like Energro and, and, and mini grid companies themselves are doing. Aaron. Should I just jump in? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it's a really interesting question. And I would say that it's sort of there's there's push and pull answers to your, your question. So um, the sort of push answer would come from a company like ours, uh, where we're trying to basically say that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that productive uses should be left to the customers to, to really define and, and what's needed. And I think on, on the other side, you have investors who are, who are really pulling, uh, where they see technology focused, productive energy companies, uh, that are working on, you know, self-contained solutions, um, solar irrigation, solar refrigeration that I mentioned earlier. Um, these are very attractive because they're, they're discrete solutions, um, that are, that are, they have a design component. They have a, they're new. Um, but at the end of the day, people just need, uh, things in rural communities in Africa that they need in rural communities everywhere. Um, which, which I would say means that we do not have to invent new things. Actually, we just have to get better at bringing those things to, to communities. And so, um, you know, if, however, it is, uh, the technology oriented companies that are being financed, um, you will see in some respects, um, uh, you know, the, the, the sector sort of like bending towards the money. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I don't think that those solutions will, will really sort of rule the day. Um, because of the it really, you know, like to, to Nathan's point, you know, there's there's agro processing companies that are getting financed today as as they should. Um, but you know, each community only needs a finite number of of those things. Uh, whereas when you take the community as a whole, um, you know, the community actually needs hundreds of things that this one technology company cannot inherently offer. So we will have to go in the direction of like we call Energro a broad catalog productive use company. You know, essentially we need, we need PUE companies that offer a, a, a basket of goods. Um, and, and that's the only way that we're really gonna see low growth in rural areas um, meet the needs of, of energy finances. So there's the, the irony of, you know, what we, what we talk about Energro as being um, in very simple terms is that pickup truck analogy that I mentioned before. Um, but when we're having more sophisticated conversations, I like to think of Energro as a, an insurance product for the energy investors, um, because it really is the unpredictability of demand, which which restricts the ability of investors to put billions of dollars into rural electrification in Africa um, and, and elsewhere. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. There's a lot of big questions, but um, uh, we really need to be thinking about those questions as we're sort of trying to figure out how to, you know, bring energy to these rural communities. At the same time, we have to think about, you know, how do we bring uh, hundreds of refrigerators to remote places in, in Congo, uh, you know, where you transport things on river rather than roads. Um, so so there's a lot of big questions in the PV space. Uh, left to be answered. Um Catherine, Laura, and Brittany, I actually want to uh, talk about this question at, to you as well in terms of where do you see the PUE sector going um, in five years' time and how we can achieve that. So maybe if you could give a short response for the last five minutes before we wrap up. Um, Laura, we'll start with you um, just to get your opinion on this. Yeah, I really liked what Aaron said. Um, there's, you know, there's, the demand's got to be there to grow. There's got to be room to scale. I think like for us as pain pump, when we look at it, um, you know, we would love to be successfully servicing thousands of farmers across Uganda. Um, and we would love to, you know, see these kind of solutions expanding to other um, markets where we work. Uh, and 
But, you know, part of that is it's just not putting a pump with a farmer. Like there needs to be a lot of like holistic support for the uptake of things like irrigation. Um, so, so when I look at it, there needs to be support across the entire like agricultural value chain. Um, we're not just going in and putting a pumping system. Like we need to be working with off takers and people who are supplying inputs. Um, so, so I think that I'm, I'm hoping that the sector will kind of come together to create more holistic solutions um, for people living in, in rural Africa. Um, yeah, and so hopefully like ultimately we'll, we will see um, improvement in food security across Uganda and beyond. Uh, Bernie, we'll come to you and then Catherine, if that's okay. Oh, Sorry, I'm, Catherine. I'm glad that Laura mentioned the word holistic there because that was just what I was going to say. Um, you know, we've been looking at this since uh, 2011. It was really interesting that back then people were just talking about how do you get energy into communities? Uh, and it was only a couple of years after that then that there was widespread understanding then that productive use was actually as important or more important than just how do you get the energy there. And I think my my hope for the, the PUE sector would be that that further evolves and people start then thinking about not just individual solutions, but this whole sort of uh, holistic community solution. So it's not just about a particular piece of technology. It's about how those uh, how those bits of productive use equipment can work together with training, as Laura was saying, uh, but then the whole sort of infrastructure of the community and everything else that's going on there, the education in the community, healthcare, um, access to the community, um, so that you can get a, a holistic, productive, I guess, productive use, but actually, I guess, socioeconomic development solution uh, is what it, I hope it will develop into. And Catherine, from you. Yeah, um, and I think I'd like just to pick up on Aaron's point about the, like, almost like I was thinking about it as an insurance policy. I think in the context of Pakistan and for much of um, Africa, you know, in Pakistan, you've just seen recently the severe flooding. And so I think there's something here about um, community resilience and an integrated approach. And this then ties into the supply chains. So how do we incentivize and support um, the, the supply chain to invest in their resilience? It's in their self-interest to ensure that they're working in partnership with the communities that they're relying on for these commodities and um, what we see in the the fashion space is you know a lot of focus on the net zero um, and they sort of talk about the the climate lens or the carbon lens and then don't think about the other dimensions of climate change which is around this resilience so when in our context um, you know there's a lot of talk in carbon credits and I'm sure a number of the panelists have thought about how to access the carbon market and to create that kind of um, willingness to pay. And that is challenging because right now the carbon price is really low for some of these um, solutions to really be viable. And then in the concept that we're developing, which is carbon insetting, I think for our corporate partners, it's like how will they get the um, financial incentive if they can't get those carbon credits, you know, they at the corporate level, they've set their carbon net zero targets. But if they can't kind of... Um, get the, the balance sheet, the carbon credits through an insetting model, then that will be challenging. So I think um, in the next, you know, and that's something that we're really focused on about is how can we create that proposition that is um, building in that resilience, that insurance policy for both the communities and the brands. And I think that kind of links finally to something that we talk about is around the impacts, you know, how do we measure and get the right set of metrics and impacts um, to really, um, yes, it's it's got to be multi-dimensional. Um, as Bernie was saying, it's it's health, it's education, it's productivity, um, and that's why I think the Energy Catalyst program has been really valuable in, in helping support teams like ours and everybody on the call um, to kind of develop those metrics around their projects. Great. Um Thanks, everyone. Um, I can't see any other questions in the chat. Um, so I think I'm going to wrap up here. I think this has been a really interesting and insightful discussion. Um, so I would like to say a big thank you to our panelists for their contributions today. Um, it's been a wonderful event. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending and being a part of the session. Um, 
I do believe the recordings will be made available on YouTube um, and I'm sure Sankal will contact you with the link after the summit if you would like to engage with them further. But if there are any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out, I guess, to any of the panelists, to Energy Catalyst or to Sankal themselves. Um, we will aim to respond to any questions or comments you may have um, as they come across. But thank you once again to everyone for attending and to our panelists and enjoy the rest of your day and the summit happening over the next few days. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very Take much. Care.